So, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Thank you for coming to this session. And uh, my name is Ilya from VWorks, based in London. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about time traveling in the universe of microservices and orchestration. I've been working on cloud native tools since about 2014. And as a company, we are running commercial SaaS product on Kubernetes and EC2. And uh, I must say, probably one of one of you know uh, early vendors in this space. We've released VivNet Overlay Network for Docker back in 2014 when I started, and uh, it's uh, it's been our flagship open source product since. However, we also built a commercial SaaS product, which is called Vive Cloud, which I'll show you at the end. And time travel is essentially one of the features we have in Vive Cloud. And I'll show you a little bit of that at the end, but uh, I'll begin by going back in time and uh, talking about some of the experience I had in the past with uh, Linux systems. And uh, I'll relate to uh, the present day when we have containers and how containers could have come could have come so useful back then in various cases. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. There'll be uh, not too technical talk and uh, hopefully quite good for, you know, after lunch talk. Um, all right, shall we start? So yeah, as I said, I'll start by uh, giving you a, a little insight into my journey in software and uh, why do I care about these things? Why do I care to come here and talk to you about this? Hopefully, um, you know, you can make up your mind by relating to it or whatnot. And, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll show you where are we today, all wonderful things we've been able to do with containers and Beave Cloud such as time travel. So before I begin, I, uh, I wanted to, to sort of to bring it up. What, what, what is it? Why, why do I care about containers? Why should you care about containers? Um, I've used Linux since uh, 2002 or three. I can't remember for sure. Uh, and uh, that's like 12 years, right? And uh, I used it in work context for about nine years now. And I've done uh, various different things. And I'll go through some of these examples momentarily. I just want to say, you know, throughout this time, uh, I learned a lot through, through the material that community puts out there on blog posts, documentation, uh, et cetera. And uh, I really uh, appreciate this information being given to me for free. and are really trying to give back to the community by going out to conferences and meetups and talking about these things. And, uh, you know, while working with Linux, uh, I, uh, I solved various kinds of problems, but two pretty major kind of predominant themes always been packages and dependency management. That was there, like, from day one, except I had no idea what, what I was doing. <laughs> I really had no idea. And then I learned a bit more, and, uh, and, and then I learned that I learned very little, and then I learned more, and <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm getting fairly good, good understanding of it, uh, but um, the tools I find most ha handy are, you know, Docker containers, Docker images. That was a big breakthrough. And second thing is resource management. It's, uh, you know, it's something that didn't hit me right away, but eventually I understood that, hey, this app is using too much memory. How do I stop it from doing that? Or I'm trying to compile something, but I'm also trying to write this document. <laughs> how, how, did, how do I make that happen nicely um, and reasonably fast? So, you know, there's magic there, but uh, container orchestration comes pretty handy here. I wouldn't trust myself in setting up C groups or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, I'd rather tell my orchestrator to do that, whether it's Mises or Kubernetes. Uh, however, you know, there, there's magic. There's no, no magic at all. You still have to understand what, what, what are you doing. Um, it just helps a little bit. So, <coughs> it was around 2005 that I went to university in England, 
And I got myself a desktop machine, uh, like a normal PC. And, you know, poked around for a while. Obviously, I installed Linux right away, right? I used Linux before that, and I installed it right there. And, uh, and you know, at some point, I kind of got bored of hardware, and I looked up, what is it there that I can buy? And I got myself a uh, Sun Ultra 5 for 30 pounds on eBay. I, I, I like the desktop a lot. I kind of, I, I admired the, the look and feel of it. I couldn't do much with it. Terminal was pretty terrible. And uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but it had this great look and feel. And I um, also really liked the keyboard. I couldn't find a photo of it. Um, but uh, yeah, well, so what happened is like, you know, I go and install Solaris 8, which is, which is what this box came, came with originally. And that worked OK. I could get the desktop. Um, but after that, I learned about Solaris 10, which just came out around that time. And I learned about containers in Solaris 10, and like ZFS and DTrace and all these cool things. I tried to install Solaris 10, and it didn't quite cut it. I mean, this machine was too slow for Solaris 10. I couldn't really use the latest OS on that. <coughs> so unfortunately, I, I only learned about, I got the taste for containers from documentation and videos and like various white papers they had and stuff. But I, I couldn't, couldn't really use containers because I couldn't run Solaris 10 on this. And I couldn't use the keyboard with my PC either. It had a different cable, but that's a separate story. So it served as a good monitor stand for a while. Um, I didn't have room for it at some point, but anyway. So that's how I learned about containers. So, you know, and after that, I was, I was using Gen2 Linux for, for a number of years. And uh, one of the first things you do with Gen2, you, you do chroot, or actually, as you, you call it, uh, shroot, right? I only learned later. I thought it's a ch root. Um, so I didn't know what that meant, but it was definitely a thing. Now that I you know, know about containers and mount namespaces, uh, I understand chroot was like a basic version of that back in the day. So I really had no idea what I was doing here. But I definitely typed that. It was in the docs. And then I learned a bit of bash and uh, like customized my prompts and stuff, right? This is what they use, but this, this is the, the sort of where I learned how to customize the prompt. <laughs> and um, you know, that was fun. And then I compiled a lot, like everything. In Gene 2, that's what you do. You compile everything, right? You compile everything from source. So I ended up compiling uh, uh, like pretty much every um, open source project that, that was somewhat popular, because um, I was curious. And uh, well, while compiling things a lot, I learned to control the way that my compile jobs use resources on the machine. And the basic way of doing that was this nice command, and later I O nice. And they were, they were quite nice, but I later learned that, that these were really rudimentary and kind of like indirect ways of managing resources on your machine. And uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to, to question whether you should be compiling your desktop OS from source or not. That is a separate discussion. However, let's move on. Uh, so, um, you know, I started hacking on some open source projects. And uh, as folks been like releasing tarballs and Debian packages and Red Hat packages, etc., uh, I wasn't getting any of those on Gene 2, so I had to compile mine. And, well, why not, right? And uh, I, I ended up doing this kind of thing most of the time. So it put, put like a new version under, under a prefix with uh, the version number in it. And I would often have to specify with something path to, to sort of tell it like where to find some headers or whatever. And, uh, and then I would install it manually. And you know, started learning these things, started grasping w how these things work. But um, I mean, yeah, it's like it was on very small scale of my desktop. As um, you know, I progressed through my university course, I was doing electronics. And uh, we didn't really do programming languages or computer science as such. Uh, we kind of did a bit of Python, and then we jumped straight to C, and not C on like Unix or Windows or whatever, but C on microcontrollers. That was quite fun, and uh, you know, but like what we did at uni is one thing, and what I did at home was like 
all open source and stuff. And at uni, we would use like some ancient compilers. And at home, I use GCC. And I picked up some microcontroller projects uh, from SourceForge, et cetera. And uh, what, what you'd often end up doing, because there are the, they wouldn't normally use automake or anything like that, you'd just use make and you'd specify CC. And then you go and check which one, wi what's the flavor of GCC that you're going to be using today. And I had multiple of those installed. A package management problem again, right? Um, so yeah, would be something like that. And then, and then sometimes you'd get like a linker error, so you got to specify LD as well. Anyway, but um, what I was getting to is that back then I've discovered, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, back then I discovered this. Um, project on SourceForge called Modules, and it was able to manage different versions of GCC on your machine. It was already quite old at the time. As I've just double-checked before this talk, it turns out that like the first uh, release of Modules was uh, back in 1998. And it was written in Tickle, and uh, I never actually used it. I, just were, I was aware of it. I thought it would be something I could use if I had to manage more versions of GCC for more people or whatever. But for myself, I was kind of just about managing. And uh, I looked it up. I was quite surprised. They, they actually, uh, somebody is actually working on this project, like, now. They've made a lot of changes recently. And uh, it's, uh, it's alive and well on, on GitHub, which was a fun discovery. Um, I wonder why they're not using Docker images. They're using this old Tickle project. In any case, so as, thing mov as things moved on, towards the end of my um, university course, I got a part-time job at a hosting company, which I'll tell you more in a minute. But I was just going to say, while working on my dissertation, I learned to use Git. And uh, you can still find that on online. But that's irrelevant to the topic. That was just means of coming to, to the point where, where I got a job. So. I'm at this working. Uh, I'm working at this hosting company. They do shared hosting. This is uh, 2007 or eight or something like that. Nine, actually. Anyway, doesn't really matter that much. The way doing shared hosting, and shared hosting was still a thing. Maybe not so many people used it, but some people did. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna like play this little video. <laughs> Um, essentially, like we had uh, some of the uh, worst dependency management, package management, config management problems. Um, you know, there would be like I don't know. We didn't have many servers, and and uh, there would be different customers running their WordPress and such kind of apps on on different servers, and some of them would have different versions of uh, PHP, like, they would require them, they would depend on them, and we, 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 we had to, like, move people around from one server to another to match up with the version of PHP they wanted. <laughs> yeah, so um, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and don't even get me started on, like, resource management, because this WordPress sites got hacked all the time. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> so that, that was a lot of fun. Um, Anyway, well, I started Googling Linux containers. I remember Solaris containers, right? And I thought, well, containers on Linux, is that a thing yet? So I started Googling that. And, um, and I remember starting to find certain things like OpenVZ. But that was kind of complicated. And it wasn't something I was able to introduce at this company. I mean, I was like a junior support person, right? <laughs> um, but I was like trying to figure out what would be a better solution to this. And uh, you know, didn't 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 even try OpenVZ at the time. Seemed complicated anyway. I was writing that dissertation anyway. So anyway, that job was over at some point. I got a DevOps job. Fancy title. Still don't know what it means. So you know, and again, I'm managing packages and dependencies and machine resources for most of the time. So some of the things we had to deal with involved, oh yeah, so we, we used Puppet, for example. And at the time I was like, oh yeah, Puppet sounds cool. Um, and I still like the syntax a lot. I think it's it's very nice and expressive syntax. 
I'm not using Puppet anymore. However, I just had this slide here because this is actually something that is quite similar to what we do today, except we do it with Kubernetes. So essentially, we were doing this kind of decentralized masterless Puppet setup where we do a git pull, or well, pull or clone or whatever, and then we go into that directory and do Puppet apply. And we do that periodically from a cron job. So essentially, we were doing decentralized Puppet with this kind of thing. And uh, it's something I'm going to show you later how we do a similar thing with Kubernetes. Similar concept, please. And you know, one of the first things I've discovered was this uh, Ruby version manager, RVM. And you would you you do this sort of like you you after you install RVM, you end up with this sort of thing in your Bash profile, right? And uh, and then, and then after you kind of like done a couple of those things, you end up with cd command ls to this function, which uh, which does magic whenever you change directories, basically. Which is great. Um, so we managed to rip that up and replaced it with this thing called rbn, which is much simpler and nicer. However, we soon introduced Clojure and Node.js and some Python and some different versions of JVM, like Cassandra was using one, while our Clojure app was using a different JVM. Fun stuff. Containers could definitely come useful there. And you know, this is you. You probably all know this. You know, uh, bes beside that that R RVM stuff, you still had to do this kind of thing where you go use one package manager to get your other package manager and that use that package manager to get your packages. No, actually, in Ruby you got the three, right? So you got you, you'd use your uh, system package manager to install Ruby gems. Once you install Ruby gems, you install Bundler, and Bundler is like a wrapper on top of gem. <laughs> I mean, uh, things are not dissimilar in Python world. Um, you know, Node.js has a little less. Anyway. But it is much easier once you can encapsulate this in your container image, and you don't have to worry about it. And eventually, they'll improve their package managers, supposedly. And we, we also had this amazing thing called Capistrano. Uh, all you had to do is go around cup deploy production. That's all you had to do. You know what I call it now? <laughs> it was a great Chaos Monkey tool, except that, you know, you 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 triggered it with a different intent. <laughs> um, anyway, let's move on. Uh, there's, there's this other thing as well, right? There was this uh, Gitflow. Uh, somebody was inspired by Gitflow blog post, and they implemented it in Go CD. If you're familiar with Go CD. Uh, and nobody knew how to use it, really. Our software wasn't that complicated. So this is designed for you know folks who do version releases, and they run different uh, versions in different environments and such things. We didn't do any of that. We didn't need any of this. So that, that I ripped that out right away. And uh, um, yeah, people just weren't aware that, that this is completely useless complexity that we had. Another thing I've happened to implement there, I mean, I removed a bunch of things and implemented this kind of thing, which was okay. Uh, we were we had this pool of VMs where developer would go and say, I want a VM, they'll run VM take, uh, and then can SSH to it and do some work and throw it away, right? And uh, we didn't have Packer. We could have used Packer if we were aware of it, but we weren't. Uh, we used VMware, okay, fine. Um, but like, you know, this could have easily been replaced with like a, a, a bunch of dog containers, really, right? So, and sometime later, um, a colleague of mine asked me to come over to his desk, saying, well, I want to check something out, and it was the first demo of Docker on Hacker News. That was pretty amazing, pretty mind-blowing, but 
At the time, I kind of like, oh, Solaris containers, things I've seen with OpenVZ, this is very different. Uh, it took, took me a little time to, 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 to get to terms with it. Uh, but I was definitely impressed with how easy it, it seemed to be. And then later, I, I started learning a bit more about Mesos, Chorus, and Console, Terraform, all these new tools. And I played around with it, and then I got a new job. I met the XRabbitMQ co-founders who just started uh, a new company, which is called Zetio at the time, now it's Vworks. And we released Vivnet just like, well, they released Vivnet before I joined. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I started working on containers. How fun is that? So fast forward to present. What have we got? Well, let's consider Vivnet, for example. It's, a, it's an application-oriented overlay network. Vivnet user doesn't really need to know anything about underlying technology, whatever it uses, VXLAN, IPsec, that kind of stuff. Users don't have to know about that. They don't have to make any changes to their underlying infrastructure to run Vivnet. And they can do things like provide identity to each other, like an IP address, get, get an IP address for each of their apps. Use default ports, don't have to use like port remapping for each instance of different apps, right? And we'll get to some of the, the examples shortly. So, oh yeah, here we go. So, like imagine this, right? In perhaps the olden days, you have two hosts, you got something running here and something else here, you got this other thing that, that gets this port and then, and then if you kind of follow this schema, you say, okay, well now I'm gonna put a couple of more things of this kind here and I go th give them these port numbers and, uh, and now I got like an okay thing, I suppose. But then I introduce another thing and I, I bump the port numbers again, different way because that's supposedly somehow, somehow slightly different thing. So if I'm doing this allocation manually, perhaps these numbers are completely different. But just imagine that you had like three different things and they're using completely different port numbers and they ha all have to be aware of what those port numbers actually mean. Where, where like if, if I hit host two on 9081, is that, is that what kind of app I'm gonna get? Well, who am I gonna get to talk to there, right? And you know, some people say, well, oh yeah, Get, get, get gets a bit more complex, as you can see. And then you're like, all right, well, let's just use DNS. But the problem is that no developers kind of like keen to, to write this sort of thing. And if they want to automate that, they'd have to read a pretty big book. And uh, they can't be bothered most of the time. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, DNS comes out of the box with Kubernetes and DCOS. We don't have to care, right? Just works now. And uh, we, we, we don't actually have to use those complex uh, service discovery mechanisms that, that were built over time. You know, there are things like, uh, I don't know, people did all sorts of things, right? I mean, my personal view is that a lot of service discovery systems like Zookeeper and Console were invented because DNS was too hard. And DNS was usually owned by an ops team and uh, managed somehow separately. For, and hard for developers to automate. Anyway, modern container orchestration systems comes with DNS out of the box. You can forget this. Don't have to buy that book. Um, and uh, if you use an overlay network such as VivNet, you can just use default port numbers for, uh, for all of your ports. Let's say all of these things talk to HTTP, right? And we use 8080 because we don't want to run it as root. And that's it. Okay, they're all on the same ports. You just connect using HTTP, host name, and 8080, and that's it. You can hard code half of those things potentially. You don't have to do some sophisticated lookup. Unless you have a particular case where you're doing like client side load balancing for whatever reason, and that makes sense. But for the majority of the cases, you can actually just hard code the ports and forget about port number lookups. And once we have containers and APIs, uh, we can, uh, orchestration APIs I'm talking about, we can implement policy. So Kubernetes has network policy, which, uh, which allows us to essentially express that 
whatever that blue thing is, it's allowed to talk to the red thing, and the red thing is not is only allowed to to other to talk to other red things, and the dark blue thing is not is is shouldn't be talking to to the red thing, you know that sort of thing. And that's something that we can do declaratively with uh, Kubernetes Network Policy API, for example. And other things we can do with the APIs is uh, distributed observability, and we do that with Weave Scope. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are kind of familiar with uh, this kind of situation where you'd have a multiple terminals running like HTOP. And you think, oh, that's cool. But like, I wasn't able, I, I was never able to process all this information. I mean, I can look at one of them, and it all makes sense. But, but put, put four or, or <laughs> eight of these things, or how many? We got? Yeah, I think this was no, three, four. Anyway, like too many for me to be able to, to actually understand. And you know, things like that too, right? Tail and multiple terminals. It's also pretty verbose and hard to process. I mean, if you stare at it all day, maybe you'll get used to it, but I struggle with it. I mean, it kind of reminds me of this a little bit. Um, so yeah, um, up runtime metadata and APIs allow us to build richer tools with a lot more context. So, you know, uh, imagine a situation like this. You kind of you went on the server and you found like, oh, there's a Java process, uh, and it's it's using some jar that that lives here. We're going to look at when that jar was last modified. Oh, that's a long time ago, right? But in order to, to, to obtain this information, you had to be aware of what's Java, jar, and wh what's, what's that thing, right? Imagine you've forgotten the concept of a Java, a jar, a Java jar, right? You, you, you kind of like, you're just thinking, okay, well, there is a process. Uh, it takes some arguments. Is that a configuration file or what is it? Um, it's hard to tell whether this represents your actual application, right? But once you packaged it in the container, you gave it a name, and that's an application. You have a version tag. You can attach extra labels as metadata to specify some specific things like build date, something like that. You can look it up in the registry using a manifest ID and find out the exact things that, that are in there and when they were pushed to the registry. Right? So we can build richer tools, having all this metadata. We can build uh, things like what we do with Vive Cloud Explorer. We can we can look at all the containers uh, that whose image begins with stock shop release, and uh, we can we can see where they run. We can dig into them and find out, like uh, in graph view, we can find out who's talking to who, and we can see m more information here about particular processes inside of it. Uh, the, there is process view as well, so you can look at lower level stuff. But essentially, you get more metadata that we can present many, uh, more meaningfully to you. And this, this is done with zero configuration. Right? And um, things like this, right? We can look at front-end service here and uh, see, see who's, to who's talking to front-end and uh, how much memory the neighbors are using, for example. And we can also go back in time. This is a time travel feature. I'll show you a live demo afterwards. Um, you can go back in time and find out what happened last night. So they look at it, 79 meg now, 71 meg last night. Well, not not that different. And uh, if you actually want to find out more, uh, you, you can you can click here, and you'd you'd go to to the monitor view where you can explore metrics and Prometheus. 
Uh, we'll get to that shortly. And you can also log into to any of these containers and take a look whether, well, this is just uh, the standard output of the container. You can also drop into the shell inside the container as well if you want to check whether there's something that, you know, you want to do some manual check of some, some, some kind or just take a look whether the output looks right still. This is something you can disable in production also. This is more of a development mode. And other things we are able to do with APIs. We are, we are able to do what we call GitOps, which is what I showed you earlier with Puppet, right? We do a similar thing where, well, you'd think it's just a git pull, kubectl apply in a loop, but it isn't really. It, it takes a little more than that because you want to be able to lock things, you want to be able to update image attribute whenever there are new images and do other things. So, so here's a Vive Cloud Deploy UI. It shows you, we're looking at front-end service here. This is the image tag we are running right now. That's cool, but we can take a look at the latest change that's been applied to the cluster. And we can see that, okay, well, it, it got automa automated. So essentially, well, in this case, I clicked on that button earlier and I automated the service. So if it sees a new tag in the registry, that will get updated in Git and synchronized with the cluster. And when I click that button, we stored an, uh, an annotation in YAML that essentially means if you, if you were to take this Git repository into a different cluster, this will be picked up from there, right? So if you rebuilt a cluster or something like that, or you just want to clone the, an environment. So you can also, you know, you can use also use Git in all different ways that you can use Git. For example, Git blame, right? You can see what changes, who made them and when. So the, yeah, this particular one, I made most of the changes, but the uh, automation tool, if Cloud Deploy, said this particular annotation here. And uh, you can correlate those with metrics we have in Prometheus. Here's a deploy event that caused a spike. What was that? So this is, is it, this is, uh, this is memory usage, I think. It's kind of pretty low. Um, however, no, that's, that's inodes, but who cares? I mean, there's the same spike in, in I rate for uh, like instantaneous rate of CPU usage uh, over five minutes. Uh, there, there's a spike there too, and there's a spike here. So I looked at this particular one. I found this Git revision, right? I went in Git and looked it up, and it turned out I scaled the, the load test deployment to 24 pods. Now that's that's what caused the spike. It went away right away, but there was there was a spike nevertheless. So now I'm going to show you that this is all real. It's a very simple demo showing how this works with Kubernetes on DCOS today. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's hope it all works still. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so I have my CloudFormation console here. Can everybody see this? Great. Um, I have my CloudFormation console. I have DCOS. I I hit this DNS domain. Um, okay, so I'm in DCOS. I can see I have Kubernetes installed. I'm running uh, the latest version of Kubernetes. It looks fairly happy. And uh, I can take a look at, I forwarded the port earlier, so, and here I got my um, Kubernetes nodes. Uh, and uh, I got some pods in the system namespace. Amongst those, I can see some uh, pods with beef prefix. So those are all the Vue Cloud agents. And uh, it looks like the status is all good, so I should be able to um, use Vive Cloud now. Okay. So, ju just to be clear, like I mean, Vive Cloud is a 
two months free trial. It's a SaaS product. Um, you run agents in your cluster. We present you this UI and all the features that come with it. So here's, uh, here's my Kubernetes cluster running on DCOS. And uh, I, can, I can take a look at any particular things here, right? So let's take a look at, um, for example, we've Cortex agent, what is this? Uh, so I can see there is a pod, let's take a look. I can already see that uh, it's, um, it's running Prometheus, right? So th this, is, uh, this is Prometheus, and Prometheus scrapes from uh, all services it sees in the cluster, and that's why it's talking to everybody. Okay, I'm happy with that. Um, I can see there is a load test against the, the front end, and the load test, uh, runs some Python process. It's got 24 pods. Let me take a look at, um, uh, some of these pods. So for example, I can do this. I can go to this pod and I can look at, uh, this pod in pods view. If I drop out, I see that, uh, I see that there are all these pods here. I select front end. I can see all the pods that talk to it. Uh, let's pick one of the, um, uh, well, I'm going to narrow it down to load test and sock shop namespace. And uh, I'm going to look at one of the load tests. Just just double check it's not getting any errors in the terminal. Okay, standard out, put them in. So you can see that. Cool, looks good. Okay. So if I'm super curious, I can actually go into one of the containers inside this pod and uh, have a look at what it's doing. Ooh, is this working? Huh? <laughs> mm. It worked earlier. Uh, the only problem we may have is Wi-Fi. Oh, cool. All right. Okay. So what do we got? Um, mm. Well, I'm just going to do this, right? Um, okay. It's running this, and there is this config file that specifies the load test. So if I'm, like, supposedly I'm very curious what's in that config file. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, flat fingers today. Config. Uh, oh, yeah, it's .py. I missed that bit. So, um, yeah, and we can we can take a look at the, the code that's running in this container if we really wanted to. Anyway, uh, what else I can show you? Oh yeah, I can show you uh, monitor view. So there's a there's the Prometheus metrics, and uh, I have a few things here. We got node resources. We can see all the all the stats about memory and CPU usage from all the nodes in Kubernetes cluster that is on DCOS. This doesn't currently run on all the DCOS uh, slaves, but that can be done too. Uh, so we can take a look at the last couple of days, for example, a whole week even. I can see, actually, it looks like, uh, so we can see like deploy event here, right? What I showed in the screenshot earlier, we can see that there's a particular git commit deployed at that time. And there were some other things deployed earlier. And uh, we can see that, well, this is this is probably the time when I created the cluster. And uh, here at the time, I think, when I've deployed the SOC shop, yeah, we can see, like, you know, there's definitely spikes in all the graphs around, around about this time. So, yeah, that looks like when I've deployed the SOC shop app. So, OK. Well, let's take a look at the de deploy history. Uh, when we, we kind of like in the overview, we can see all the different uh, events that took place. We can have a look at um, some of these things that I showed earlier. For example, this thing I think we had on screenshot. Yeah. Okay. So we go to to GitHub. We can see this. And we can navigate this repo. We can view the file and and potentially look at the, um, history and see all the commits that uh, there are. 
So, and you can see that there, there are the automated commits from, from the system, the Flux user, and there are commits from, from me. So I can make changes to, to, to the repo as well as the Cloud Deploy makes changes to the repo. Um, so going back to, to Vive Cloud, you can take a look at this front-end service, for example, and you can see uh, all the events that relate to the front-end service more specifically, right? And uh, now I'll show you the time travel feature. If I go back to live mode, or actually I can go straight back to time travel, so there are three main modes, live, pose, and time travel. So if I go back to the time before I deployed the sock shop, I can zoom out, and I think that was on the 24th, right? We can see that there are a lot less things here. We can see there are just the, the system pods, uh, or we can even look just, uh, control is probably easier to look at. And sometime around this time, I deployed the sock shop. And later, so th oh, this time the, the load test is alre uh, already has 24 pods. So if we keep this selected, we can go back a bit. And I think at the beginning, I only had two. Uh, I need to fine tune my uh, time scale here. OK. Yeah, it was around that time of the night. <laughs> Uh, clearly, this is not the production system. This is just a demo environment. So, I've been working at it late at night. <laughs> um, yeah, we we can see how this uh, was different a little earlier on. Uh, oh, this time scale is like super fine. I gotta zoom out a bit more. Yeah, so we can see now it's two pods, right? And, uh, you know, we can observe things like this. So, yeah, well, uh, here comes time travel. Uh, I think uh, I actually managed to finish this earlier than I thought. We didn't overrun. We still have time for questions. Please. Um, uh, does it understand layer 7? Uh, no, we don't have insight into what goes on in layer 7, like as in, you mean HTTP requests, yeah. No, we haven't got insight into that. So it operates on layer 3? Yeah, but we do have a, a plugin that looks at layer 7. Oh. Uh, the, there's a plugin that, that is able to introspect HTTP requests using eBPF. Cool. And does it use uh, kind of TLS, like uh, VXLAN or? For for networking? Yeah, between the nodes. Uh, well, in this demo, I actually did not use VeeVNet, and VeeVNet is not required to use VeeCloud. Uh -huh. uh, VeeVNet is a separate project, essentially, and the visualization that you saw, that does not depend on the network. You can oh. use that with any network. Oh, cool. Yeah, but if you'd like to use VeeVNet, we, we use VXLAN and uh, IPsec as well. Some some of uh, some of our customers who use DCOS chose VeeVNet because they they need encryption actually, and we provide IPsec that is really easy to configure. Actually, you don't have to know anything about IPsec to use IPsec and VeeVNet. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? No, over recording. Um, is there any kind of performance hit on running the agents? No, it's pretty low overhead. Yeah, we, we work pretty hard to to make, for example, the um, the Explore UI uh, that did have a performance impact, and we managed to optimize that by switching to eBPF, which is this kernel technology that allows you to uh, do interesting things in kernel space. So it's pretty fast, and. Uh, yeah, some some of the other things like Prometheus are pretty low overhead. Are we good? Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.